Luke 24, verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others were with them. And they found the, sepul or the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Well, then they should have said, well, praise the Lord, exactly what the Lord said. This is exactly what he said was going to happen. But look what happens here. Verse 4, And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Do you understand, folks, that this is not years difference between when Jesus was telling them, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to rise the third day. And a couple days later, when it actually happens, I mean, we're not, we're not even talking a week later here. We're talking a few days later. And it's just like, they're there in the grave. They're going, what in the world happened here? I don't understand. I, I mean, we came here to see the body of Jesus, and the body's not here. <laughs> Within days of Jesus saying, I'm going to rise from the dead. But they were looking forward to being saved by the cross. Sure they were. Verse 5, And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. These angels are going, Don't you remember? Just a few days ago? Remember? You know, remember? Is it ringing a bell here? You know? Verse 7, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Oh, yeah, you know, he did say that. Yeah. <laughs> and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Jonah, or Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And certainly the apostles, you know, they were like, well, of course, you dumb women. Of course, you know, I mean, give me a break. We knew that, right? Wrong. Read verse 11. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. <laughs> you know, Jesus told them, they are like, no, I don't believe that. You know, three days later, and angels come and they say, do you remember what Jesus said? And they go, yeah, yeah, we do remember. They go to the apostles and they're like, hey, we saw angels. They told us the stuff that Jesus you know, said was going to happen, happened. And the apostles are going, oh, yeah, angels. You know, and I guess you saw the Easter bunny in Santa Claus, too. You know, I mean, yeah, idle tales. Sure you did, ladies. Uh-huh. You know. For the non-dispensationalists out there that are saying, well, you know, I believe that they were saved, you know, this... Looking forward to the cross thing. What do you do with this stuff? Luke 24, verse 15. We'll read this. It says here, And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Okay, this is after the women came and told him, you know. And the one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? I love this reaction of Jesus. It says here, verse 19, And he said unto them, What things? <laughs> you just got to love the Lord's sense of humor, you know. He, he's basically blinded their eyes. They, they can't see. It's, they're just seeing this guy there. And it's just like they don't recognize him as Jesus. And they say, you know, haven't you been around? Don't you know what just happened here? And Jesus goes, what? What? What, what things? You know? Hmm. But continuing here. Verse 19, And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Oh, so he's just a prophet now. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. 
And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went, and went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. So Jesus told them this stuff, and you know it's, it's like the women saw it, but we have to see Jesus personally and believe it. Now look what Jesus says here, verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter in, into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, like we started out in this study, he expounded unto them in the, all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Why did Jesus do a thing like that? I mean, these guys obviously were being saved by looking forward to the cross. He didn't have to explain it to them. They knew. They knew all this stuff. No, they didn't. No, they did not. Don't fall for this non-dispensational lie that they were saved by looking forward to the cross. That is a lie, an absolute, complete, total lie. It is so easy to debunk. I mean, you're reading it right here. We're going through the scriptures. These people had no idea. None. Jump down to verse 44. Luke 24, verse 44. Then said he unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I, was, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So, there you see it. Jesus Christ is saying, okay, you know, I'm going to explain it to you one more time here. You know, we're going to open the scriptures and I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you all the prophecies of the Old Testament. I fulfilled them all. Okay? Now stay here. I'm going to give you your orders, you know, for what's going on. You're going to understand here, you know, that I died on the cross and buried and rose again. And, you know, that's what's going on. John chapter 1, verse 29. You turn over there. You say, well, then nobody understood who Jesus Christ was. No, not necessarily. John chapter 1, verse 29 through 34. It says here, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and said, saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After he cometh, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, record to what? The Old Testament prophecies saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. He saw that as well. you know. And so John there, being filled with the Holy Ghost, he was prophesying and giving and saying, you know, I'm the one voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. Okay, Jehovah in the Old Testament. God the Father manifest in flesh as a man, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's going on there. So John did understand who Jesus was, right? And he didn't see him at first and things like that until the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. And then at that point, he says, oh, okay, there's the one right there, right? That's the Savior of the world. And it's interesting because John goes on later on to say that he's the friend of the bridegroom. He was one of the last Old Testament saints. The Old Testament saints, when that system ended, they were going down to Abraham's bosom there. They couldn't go to heaven because their sins were not paid for. Their sins were covered by that system of, of law that they had in the Old Testament. The animal sacrifices and, the, and the, the things that Moses commanded that were written in the law, those things were there, okay, that system of Old Testament law, but they didn't go right to heaven when they died, like a Christian does today. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Don't believe this thing of soul sleep. And yet when you die as a Christian, you go down there and you're waiting for the resurrection. Your body waits for the resurrection, but your soul and your spirit go to be with the Lord. All right. Again, that's another study. 
But the point is, you have to get the differences in the Bible. And if you don't get the differences, you're just going to make a mess of things. And the Bible is not going to make sense. You know, people say the King James Bible has lots of contradictions in it. And you know what? They are absolutely 100% correct. So, what? I thought you said the King James Bible is perfect. Oh, it is. The contradictions, let me clarify that, are dispensational differences. You see, there are different Gospels that are preached. Oh, heresy, heresy. It's always, the Gospel's always been Jesus Christ. No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. It was in the Old Testament, but it was veiled as prophecy for the future. And when Jesus Christ is physically present on the earth, even after he dies on the cross, is buried, comes up the third day, they still are doubting. So don't give me this nonsense. Oh, the, salvation has always been by Jesus Christ. Okay? Salvation is by doing, you know, you go back to the Old Testament, they were doing the animal sacrifices and things there, looking forward to the time when Jesus Christ would die on the cross, go down and preach to the spirits that are in prison down there. Now the blood has been shed. Now they can go out of there and go up to be with the Lord. You say, that's heresy. No, that's called the Bible. That's called what the King James Bible teaches. And non-dispensational heretics have to somehow deny that and say, no, no, see, they, they went to heaven, they, were, they had eternal security. I love that one too. They have eternal security in the Old Testament, even though David, you see him saying, you know, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, you know, or, you know, he's, he's pleading with God, don't take your spirit from me. You know, King Saul, the spirit of God's on him and then his evil spirit's on him and things like this. You know, oh, but they had eternal security. Sure they did. No, they did not. But uh, let's continue here. Go next to John chapter 4. And of course, you know, what's the real motivation behind non-dispensationalism? Well, it basically comes around, brings you around to the point where Christians replace Israel. Because you see, you know, everybody's always been saved the same way and God gets rid of Israel in the New Testament there. And so now it's the church. The church goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time of the church's trouble. The great tribulation, you know, that comes upon the church to purify the church and make sure that you're truly saved. Even though you have eternal security in the, the tribulation um, and only those that are truly saved are not going to take the mark and those that weren't ever truly saved. Are, this system is so messed up. It's so warped if you don't rightly divide the word of truth. You know, it's crazy. It's insane. But let's continue with our study here. John chapter 4, verse 19. Okay, here you have Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. It says here, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. We, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and the Father, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us, all things. She didn't even recognize who he was. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Yes, Jesus did say that he was the Messiah of the Jewish people. Verse 27, And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Okay? She knew that there was a prophet coming, but the fact is Jesus had to explain things to her. Why? If she's looking forward to getting saved by the cross, you know, and all this other stuff. See? Again, it doesn't work. Next, go to John chapter 6. I mean, that woman had a very high understanding of Scripture. You know, she, she understood that the Messiah was coming. 
and he was going to show all things and, and everything like that. But even she did not quite understand, you know, that he was going to have to die. She was looking at it as he's going to come and restore the kingdom. And it's going to be Jerusalem there, the city of the great king. Right? She didn't quite understand that he was going to die on the cross. So, John chapter 6, verse 51 says here, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is, the bread, this is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue, as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth, doth this offend you? What, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Is it, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Again, you can watch the study about the Mass thing. The Catholics, they take this to mean that you actually have to eat and drink the blood, flesh and blood of Jesus, literal flesh and blood, which is nonsense. Uh, verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that, uh, who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Why did the other disciples leave him? Because they didn't understand what Jesus was trying to signify there. Jesus was not saying to them, You have to eat my literal flesh and drink my literal blood. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, I'm going to die as a sacrifice to pay for your sins. One more time, if they were saved by looking forward to the cross, don't you think they would have understood? Don't you think that they would have been like, well, oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 I got it there, Lord, yeah, sure, I got that. But they didn't. Now we're going to go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. It says here, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Reference to the rapture, by the way. Verse 4, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Hmm, you see it there again. Jump down to verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. There was a Division, therefore, all again among the Jews for these sayings. Why? If they're looking forward to being saved by the cross and all this other stuff, why is there a division? 
just doesn't work out. John chapter 12. A couple more places to turn to here today. John chapter 12, verse 23. It says here, And Jesus answered, it, answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this hour, or but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Golden opportunity again here, Old Testament saints, you know, Old Testament people here. You know, because the Old Testament is in effect until the death of the testator, Hebrews chapter 9. So they have a golden opportunity here to look forward to the cross. He just explained to them what death he's going to die. Verse 34, the people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever, and how sayest thou that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? They don't even know who he is. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Kind of like non-dispensational people. Verse 36, while ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Where did we read that earlier? Isaiah 53. You know what a lot of the devout Jews, the Orthodox and things like that, you know what they still believe? They still believe the same things as these Jews here in the first century. They still don't believe in Jesus Christ. Even though Isaiah 53 in the Old Testament, which they accept, Isaiah 53 clearly was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. They still reject him. Hmm. Interesting. Verse 39, Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. What did we read earlier? You got to go outside of the camp, outside of the city, outside of the uh, church building, you know? You got to go outside and bear his reproach. You have to be a castaway. People get you and say, you're nuts. Get, get away from me, you know? I mean, I recently heard a story of a, of a young man who got saved and his, his mother put him in a mental institution. See, that's the kind of thing that comes upon you when you truly get converted, when you truly get saved. You know, not necessarily that exact thing. I'm not saying unless you've been in a men, mental institution, you're not a good Christian. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you will lose uh, friends, you will lose family, people will cast out your name as evil. Why? Because you're outside the camp. You're outside the gate. You're out there bearing the reproach of Jesus Christ. But again, a lot of these people aren't believing. Why not? They had all the Old Testament prophecies. Jesus fulfilled them all. All right. Ephesians chapter 3. You say, Brian, was this whole study really worth it? I mean, is this 
you know, all these verses and stuff. Well, of course, it's good to go through the Scriptures. You know, it's, it's good to stay in the Word of God. The things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. You know, I understand that. The Old Testament's there so that we can understand things today in the New Testament. Uh, that certainly is there. But, you know, there's a lot of simple instructions that you have for a Christian right in the Pauline epistles, the epistles that are written to you as a New Testament Christian. And they're just written there. They're right there, plain English, simple, plain English, like 2 Timothy 2.15, a command to rightly divide the word of truth. And all you got to do is just obey. Just submit to what Paul has written here and say, you know what? This is written to me. Paul's the apostle of the Gentiles. I'm a Gentile believer. You know, I'm a Christian. You know, the Bible talks about there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ. So even if you are a real true Jew, according to the flesh, you know, you're still a Christian. So you still go with the Pauline epistles. And, you know, you just read the Pauline epistles and do what it says there and believe it as it stands. But see, non-dispensational heretics have to go and steal things from other parts of the Bible because that's what they do. That's why, like I said before many, many times, the non-dispensational heretics, almost every single one I've ever run into, every single one believes in replacement theology. All of them. They all believe that they take the promises of the Jews. I mean, I'm reading, I'm studying Jewish culture right now reading some books on them and stuff like that, I feel humbled. I feel humbled to be born into this system. Salvation is of the Jews. The oracles of God are written by the Jews. This is a Jewish book. My Savior's Jewish. Okay, he's going to rule from Jerusalem one day. You know, and to me, it's like I'm, I'm kind of like an adopted child that's being brought into this family reunion and I'm kind of going, none of this stuff looks familiar to me. My family's from Germany. You know, I'm not from Israel, okay? And I come in and I'm just kind of going, whoa, you know, and it's like, hey, come on in, come on in. You're welcome here. The household of faith. You're welcome to the household of faith. But I'm real careful about speaking against that household. I'm born in, I'm just an adopted child, okay? I don't have any right, birthright to that nation, but let me just show you the simple instructions that Paul gives here. And this whole thing of they were saved by looking forward to the cross, the whole thing can just be debunked just by reading this, just a couple verses and believing what's said here. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. For this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And what was it? Verse 6, That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Where, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Hmm. So, this mystery has been hidden. We can, you see, we have a great benefit here. We, we have the King James Bible. If you're English speaking, you know, Schlachter 2000, or some people try to, you know, say with the Heilige Schrift, you know, for the German people, or there's some other, you know, different editions and things out there for your language. Uh, if, you know, make sure it's conforming here and, and things like that. This has been a standard. The Lord has proved for over 400 years now. But the fact of the matter is, we have a tremendous benefit that we can actually look back at these Old Testament prophecies. And we can say, oh yeah, look at that. Isaiah chapter 53, and look at there in Psalm 22, and look at there in the book of Genesis. And we can see this, and we can see, and it's all leading up. That mystery, we can look back now and we can see that mystery was there. But it was hidden from the people 
in the past. That's why even like I've been saying, the disciples, even they didn't understand what Jesus Christ was going to do. Even they didn't get it. And see, the gospel that we have today was revealed to Paul. Now that doesn't mean like the hyper-dispensationalists teach that there was another body, you know, Peter, James, John, and those guys, that was a body from the crucifixion to Paul, and now we have to Paul to the rapture. That's hyper-dispensationalism, heresy, it's nonsense. Paul writes in Romans chapter 16 about, you know, people that were in Christ before him. So it's easy to debunk hyper-dispensationalism. But the point is, you can't say the whole Bible all lines up for a Christian. You can't do that. And you say, well, then we have to go through all the scriptures. Well, it doesn't hurt you to go through all the scriptures that we did today. But brethren, all you really need is written right there. Ephesians chapter 3, just believe it as it's written. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, believe it as it's written. It says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if I tell you, rightly divide things, you don't say, I want to put it all together. You know? I mean, back when we moved in here to the ministry headquarters, we had lots of boxes of books. And when we were taking them off the truck, I said, hey, another box of books. Or my wife would take a box out and she'd say, hey, another box of books. Where are we going to take it? Well, I think I'm going to take it down to the basement over near the sump pump. Why would I do a thing like that? No, you take it to the library area here, the area where we have our books at. You say, oh, I think I'm going to take a box of the books over to the bathroom. No, you take it to where the bookshelf is. Uh, why don't we take a box of books up to the bedroom area? No. Rightly divide what you have. You must rightly divide the word of truth. If you're not seeing people in the Old Testament getting saved by faith in Jesus Christ, if I mean, it's just simple. Look up the word Jesus. The word Jesus isn't in the Old Testament. You say, but the prophecies are... But they didn't understand the prophecies. It was a mystery to them. And I, I dare say, there's a lot about the time of Jacob's trouble that we aren't going to understand in this dispensation. Okay? There's a lot of stuff that's going on in there in the future. I don't understand it. You know, oh, Brian Denlinger, the great Bible scholar and all this other stuff. Hey, man, there's a lot of stuff about this book I don't get. I don't understand. Why? The whole thing's not written to me. There are parts of this book that are not pointed doctrinally at me. Instruction in righteousness, yes. I can take this Bible and I can learn. I can be corrected from it. I can, can use it for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's true. But you have to be very careful about doctrine. There are doctrines that do overlap with different dispensations. God is always good. The devil's always evil. Saved people go to heaven. Lost people go to hell. That's never going to change. Okay? That never goes, that's never going to change. All right. But what I'm saying is there are other parts of this book you have to rightly divide. And when you refuse to do that, and you, you have to start making up lies like people were saved by looking forward to the cross. But all you got to do to debunk that is just read and believe what you see here in Ephesians chapter 3. All right. It was a mystery. It was first revealed to Paul. One other place, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. Okay, it says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, you know, I believe in the princes there. I mean, it's, I think it's even a reference maybe to the principalities and things. They didn't even understand the crucifixion. Hmm. If they knew it, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus Christ. I mean, you talk about a victory. <laughs> victory in Jesus, you know. I mean, anybody can get saved anybody you know before in the old testament there you had all the people all these gentile nations and things like that they were without hope and without god lost what hope did you have You're just heathen that's all you were in the old testament but now we're made nigh by the blood of christ 
You know, Jesus Christ said to the woman at the well, he said, the time is coming when ye shall neither at this in this in Jerusalem here or in this mountain worship God. You can worship God in spirit and in truth. Anywhere. You don't have to come here to our ministry headquarters here to get saved. You can do it right where you're sitting, right now. You can get saved. Right? And again, like I always say, you can go to the salvation message, go to the main channel page, just click on my username, husky394xp, go there, go to the main channel page. If you're not a subscriber, click on the salvation message and watch it. If you are a Jew, I highly recommend that. And you better just throw caution to the wind, by the way, when it comes to your family and acquaintances and all the people that you're used to being around and understand your Messiah has already come. He already fulfilled those Old Testament scriptures. And you say, well, I don't think I, I just, I don't feel like I should believe in that stuff. Okay, then you're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. And you are going to wish that you had not been born if you go into that time. And my, more and more as I get older in the Lord and I, I, I have, uh, there's a burden building within me to, to get this truth to the Jewish people. I'm very, very, very um, worried for them because I know that a lot of them are going to get killed in that time of Jacob's trouble. It's going to be a bad time. It's going to be a very bad time. And the best thing that you can do right now is accept Jesus Christ as your Messiah, as your Lord, as your Savior. Okay? So, that is going to be it for this study. I've been wanting to put this one together. Another, another one that I get a question about occasionally. And again, I can... Now I have a sermon. I can point people right there. Go to that one, you know. And and again, I, I really do appreciate my viewers. A lot of times I see you saying, "Here's a sermon," you know, on that subject. And I'll see you guys putting links into my different studies. Uh, that that's a a tremendous help to me. Uh, we're not all called into this ministry of preaching the word and and spreading you know all this stuff and and everything, you know. And that's fine, um, totally fine. But we can all do our part, and I, I need people to come alongside and help me in the ministry, and, and you see people that are, you know, putting in questions and stuff like that, and, you know, it, it, sometimes it's very hard to understand the spirit behind a comment. Sometimes you get somebody, and it looks like they're trying to be arrogant, and they're just really asking a question. They just don't really word it all that well, and, you know, we have to be somewhat patient. Now, I, I mean, I realize that there are some people that are just evil and wicked and they're just on here just to cause strife and division. And uh, I'm a little bit nasty with those people a lot of times. And I usually try to practice the, the, the rule there in Titus chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, I believe it is, where it talks about, you know, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. You know, I try to do that. Two admonitions and then I'm done is what I usually try to do. But, um, you know, these non-dispensational people, uh, it's just, it's a real problem. It's a, it's a very big problem. I mean, they are openly rejecting portions of Scripture. They are openly rejecting commands to rightly divide the word of truth. And as a result, they make a mess of the Bible. So, if you have been falling for that, I pray that you would study this issue better and just get yourself right with God. Okay, that's, that's very important. So, that is going to be it. We'll close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that we have such a benefit now, Lord, that we can look back and we can see the Old Testament prophecies and how you fulfilled them in the New Testament. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for dying on the cross to pay for our sins and that uh, we can be saved, Lord, by simple faith in that shed blood. And uh, you just take away our sins, Lord, and, and just wash them clean, and you give us a brand new life. Uh, what a blessed thing, Lord, to, to know that, that you took our transgressions, Lord. You were, you were whipped, you were bruised, you were spit upon, you were mocked. And you just you took all of that, and you gave us, took away our, the filthy rags of our own self-righteousness, and, and gave us your, your pure, clean record. And uh, we can start over again. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for being that Passover lamb, that blood, that perfect blood that was spilled, the lamb without blemish and without spot. 
Thank you, Lord, for fulfilling the Old Testament. And I do pray, Lord, that if there are any of your people, your chosen people, the Jewish people listening, I pray, Lord, that you would prick their conscience and help them to understand that, that you did fulfill the Old Testament laws and, and the Old Testament prophecies. And I just uh, pray that they would come to you as their Savior. And I just ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Um, I've been uh, doing, like I said, I've been trying to research more of the Jewish culture, the Jewish ways and things, and find some very interesting things. Definitely making more sense some of the stuff I've read in the Bible uh, when you study the Hebrew customs and things like that. And it's interesting because, you know, there again, you get a lot of these replacement theology people and they will pick on um, more of the liberal modern sects of Judaism but they'll stay away from the ultra-Orthodox or the ones that are really, say, the Bible alone. We don't. We reject the Talmud. It's not Scripture. We reject um, some of the other traditions and things like that, the Kabbalah, you know, the mystical Judaism and things like this. You know, they'll, they'll kind of ignore that and they'll say, well, see, Jews are wicked because there's some here that practice mystical Kabbalism, you know, or whatever. Uh, that's ridiculous. That's kind of like writing a book about Christians and including liberal Methodists and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Catholics, I mean, with Bible-believing Christians and saying, see, that's Christianity. That's why I reject Christianity. That's stupid, okay? Um, there are a lot of Jews out there that are very orthodox, that uh, hold to the Old Testament as their standard for all matters of faith and practice. You know, do they believe in Jesus Christ? No, not yet, but uh, they will in the future. I believe many of them are going to get saved, but uh, they're not. You shouldn't include them into the more liberal Jews and a lot of these people that just, you know, don't even really hold the Bible in much of an authority anymore. Um, not a fair classification. So I do have some studies planned on that. Um, I've been getting some good stuff together, uh, some rabbis and things like that uh, that have said that Jesus did not fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. And they're giving scripture and they're, and they're trying to debunk the thing of Jesus fulfilling the scriptures. And why does this New Testament verse, in the it's saying that it was fulfilled, but in the Old Testament it reads differently. Another big mistake that it, a lot of these Jews make is they confused first coming and second coming passages. They a lot of times will lump in second coming passages in with first coming passages. And they say this is all supposed to happen when Jesus showed up on the earth. you know, Or when their Messiah, excuse me, when their Messiah showed up on the earth. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to rightly divide. Say, you have to go back in there and you have to say, no, wait, this was the first coming. This will be the second coming. That's why there in the book of Zechariah, you see the Jews when Jesus Christ comes back and they see the nail scars in his hands and his feet and they, they're weeping, they're mourning. Why? Because they realized they rejected him the first time. As a nation, they rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. That's why they're mourning. That's why they're weeping. So uh, it's going to be an interesting study. It's going to take a lot of work. Um, I have a lot of other projects that I need to get done first here. But uh, I just I really feel a burden to uh, defend the Jewish people because um, you know the Bible says that they're going to be driven back to their land and. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a prophecy here the Lord's been kind of showing to me, and that is God had to do some pretty bad things to get the Jews to leave Germany and go back to Israel. And there's a lot of rich Jews here in America, lots of rich Jews here in America. There are whole areas where there are multi-billion billionaire Jews here in this country. And I remember telling a, a, some brethren years ago, we were talking about this, and I said, I wonder what God's going to have to do to America to get the Jews to leave it. Not fun to think about, but it's there. You know, um, I think there's some persecution coming for the Jewish people, and of course, real Bible-believing Christians are going to get lumped in with that probably. And you know, I'm already having people attacking me because I'm attacking Stephen Anderson. They're calling me a Zionist and a Jew and all this other stuff. Whatever, uh, I'll bear the reproach of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was Jewish, so you know, I'll bear some of his reproach. Whatever, but uh, the fact of the matter is. I believe that there's some very bad times coming for those Jewish people. And, you know, 
if I could have gone back to Nazi Germany and seen the early propaganda stages coming out with Joseph Goebbels and, and these guys and they're, they're coming down on the Jews and they're saying that they're polluted and the church has replaced them and they're just wicked, evil people, whatever, I would have defended them back then. I would have tried to, to fight against that Nazi propaganda. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm seeing that same propaganda. It's the same words. You know, Stephen Anderson is using the exact same wording as the, the Nazi propaganda, as Martin Luther's tract, you know, on the Jews and their lies. I mean, he's using the same words. The guy doesn't even have enough brains to come up with his own original thoughts. He's just spewing the hatred against the Jewish people, against the nation of Israel. And that movement is going to get more and more and more popular. You say, well, Brian, if you're saying it's going to happen, then why are you fighting against something that you're saying is a you know, bygone conclusion or something like that? Well, because the Lord Jesus said that the offenses must needs come, but woe to the man by whom the offense cometh. I'm going to fight against those offenses. I believe that they are going to happen, but I'm going to try to get some Jews saved before that time comes. I'm going to try to get some Jews warned about this lying false prophet, Stephen Anderson. And, you know, Tex Mars and any of these other anti-Semitic Catholics, closet Catholics. And let me just say this, too, before I close, this, this whole thing of, you know, uh, a lot of Anderson's followers are like, well, you know, Catholics believe in the Trinity, so I guess that makes you a Catholic because you believe in the Trinity. Um, the Bible teaches the Godhead there, the Trinity, also known as the Trinity. Uh, it's a Bible doctrine. So the Catholics believing in it just shows that they have at least some sense in that area. But the Bible doesn't teach replacement theology. I debunked that whole thing in last week's sermon. The Bible does not teach replacement theology. Quite the opposite. So you can't say, well, Catholics believe this, same thing that you believe, and so that justifies Stephen Anderson teaching replacement theology. No. I believe the Bible. If the Catholics line up with the Bible, okay, we're all right in that point. You know, but when they cross the Bible, then that's wickedness. And you study all the people that have ever gone after the Jews, most of them were Catholics. No, let me, let me rephrase that. All of them were Catholics. All people that have ever persecuted the Jews were Catholics. Okay, You don't see Christians in the, in the first century saying, let's go out and kill some Jews. Let's go take their land from them. You don't see that. They're saying, hey, your enemies, according to the gospel... But according to the election, you're beloved of the Father's sake. Paul is saying, you know, Paul said at one point that he wished that he could be accursed. For my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, you know, who are Israelites, you know. The Christians have never gone out and tried to take the Jews' land from them. Catholics do. You say, what about the Muslims? Muslims are Catholics. It's a branch of Catholicism. So all these people that are against the Jews and all going after the Jews, they all go back to Roman Catholicism. What is Stephen Anderson? He's a Catholic. I don't care if he calls himself independent fundamental Baptist. If he believes and is pushing Roman Catholic replacement theology, he himself is a Catholic. He is a servant of Rome. He is not a servant of Jesus Christ. And his little followers can get as upset as they want because I'm kicking their little God, but I really could care less. I know what the Bible teaches, and it teaches that God has future plans for that nation of Israel. And that's why I'm going to fight this whole system of replacement theology, because it is wicked. You know, it creeps me out when I see images of the six plus million Jews that were killed under Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany. Executed, exterminated. Why were they like that? Oh, it's because uh, there was a lot of propaganda put out about the Jews not being the real Jews, you know, and all that stuff, that they're less than animals, you know, and they make caricatures, hideous caricatures of their faces and things like that. It's disgusting. So, anyhow, I'm going to quit now. Uh, I thank you for watching, and uh, like I said, I have some, some more studies coming up here about the Jews and things like that, but I have, I have some other things I need to get done too with the house church movement and with some other uh, subjects that I need to finish up. So please keep us in your prayers. Thank you to all who donate. And as always, and we pray for God's blessing upon you. And um, 
I guess that's going to be it. So we will see you next week. I'm not sure what we're going to be speaking about, but uh, it'll be an interesting subject for sure. So uh, thank you for watching.